Um, so one of the questions we're often faced with is why political education? When there are so many other actions to focus on, electoral strategies and community outreach alike, why is political education important? Well, I personally think one thing that's important to understand is how our political structure is so heavily moderated and controlled from day one. Our understanding of not only socialism and communism, but of the Democratic Party, of our foreign policy, how our country exists in the world is heavily distorted to portray this hegemonic power in its best light. We're encouraged toward a romanticism of its corruption and racist ideas of moral destiny to govern the world. If we only rely on the insufficient education that most of us receive in school, we can't truly understand the world around us, and we won't be equipped to understand the reason DSA or any other leftist organization exists in the first place, or how to advocate for our reasons. <coughs> Each of us needs to be able to understand and communicate our why. Why socialism? Why, cap why not capitalism? And why now? Um, and this moderation and control is so well done that so many of us never question it directly. As the Democratic Party plays the role of the good guy, and our country sells us the idea that this is as free and as good as it gets, people are alienated from one another in their suffering and convinced that politics just can't work for them. It's all the same, and no one has ideas or answers for how unbearably hard life can be. We're all so used to feeling that we aren't heard or seen by our political leaders, and we hope that political education can be, become a place where we can connect with one another and support one another as we develop our own voices in discussing politics. Um, without an understanding of how power works, we can't effectively strategize or challenge it. Our hope is that night school becomes a tool to sharpen our own skills of arguing and reasoning against <coughs> anti-socialist, anti-communist propaganda. It is impossible to organize an effective pathway forward to a more just future without an understanding of where we've been in the past, the tools of the opposition that will aggressively defend its power, or even without understanding where the, ourselves as the left have gone wrong and fallen short in the past, and where we need to self-reflect. Night School is meant to add depth to the critical work that happens throughout the chapter, making theory and further education around key issues more digestible and accessible for everybody. Um, and my last point, this is kind of me envisioning what I want night school to become in the future, um, but it's not enough for only a few to understand the basics of theory and analysis behind our movement. Our goal should be to empower all people from all backgrounds with an education to help them rethink their relationships to labor, their relationships to politics, to power, and to the people around them. Only through educating and centering those who suffer most in our system can we ever approach what we should become as an organization. Speaking of DSA. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to introducing our guest speakers. Um, who are going to walk us through a, dis a discussion about the Communist Manifesto tonight. We have Peter Minotti and Alice Westerman. Um, just a little bit about each. Alice is a newcomer to Astoria. Um, she's in Queens DSA, and she's an organizer. She works in global health communications, and she's an organizer with Queens DSA. Peter has been in the Lower Manhattan branch of New York DSA since 2020, um, and we're happy to have both of them tonight. Uh, thank you. Like Ashley said, I'm Peter, um, and I'm going to start us off by talking us through historical materialism, which is Marx's theory of history. Um, theory of history is basically an answer to the question, how does historical change happen? Now, uh, in his early life, Marx was a part of a group of German intellectuals called the Young Hegelians, who followed the philosophy of Wilhelm Hegel. Um, Hegel had a theory of history that was a dialectical theory of history, which meant that history progressed by overcoming contradictions between concepts. Now, Hegel was an idealist. He thought that historical progress was about raising human consciousness by resolving contradictions in systems of knowledge and in value systems. Marx, on the other hand, was a materialist, uh, which meant that he thought that historical progress was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. He's uh, also on your worksheet. Yeah, uh, materialist. Which meant that Marx thought that historical progress was about the resolution of contradictory material interests. Now, material interests break down based on your social class. 
And what Marx defined the social class as was an economic role in a social system. So you performed a certain role in your society's productive processes, and you got a claim to the wealth that that society produces. Uh, different classes within the same society can have contradictory material interests. So for example, your boss has an interest in paying you less so that they can take home more in profit. You have an interest in getting paid a higher wage for your labor. Um, and that is why Marx said that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And a lot of Marx's political principles and a lot of his strategy for action is rooted in this theory of history, which is why Marx lives with it in the Communist Manifesto, which is why I am talking to you right now. Um, so Marx actually lived at the tail end of one of history's all-time great class conflicts, the French Revolution, which was a class conflict between the feudal ruling classes the nobility and the clergy, and the bourgeoisie. Um, and in Marx's time, that was sort of a key point of reference for basically every political thinker. Uh, a lot of things were defined with reference to this event. So, like Marx did, we are going to talk through the events of the French Revolution and use those to understand historical prog progress in general. Uh, so, what came before the French Revolution? The pre-revolutionary French society was a feudal society. <laughs> now, feudalism is a political system where the state is controlled by a king and by a nobility, and the clergy sanction this as God's chosen structure for society. And it's also a economic system of basically the self-sufficient estates governed by nobles and worked by peasants. Um, brief aside here about peasants. Uh, they are a class, they are an oppressed class, but they are not the same as the working class of the capitalist. Peasants have feudal dues that they owe to their lord, which can take the form of obligatory labor, taxes in cash, or a part of what they produce, and they are generally not allowed to leave their lord's estate, but they do have rights to farm the land and to use whatever they produce above and beyond their feudal use. Not the same as wage labor. So, this is not a terribly productive method of production, but what it does do is it provides local self sufficiency. And in particularly the middle or early Middle Ages, uh, trade networks and communication networks are in poor shape. It's often dangerous. So being able to produce everything you need locally is very important. So the system meets that. But as time goes on, changes to the economy start to occur within feudalism. Trade networks start to open up. Communications and technology improve. And society becomes less reliant on local agricultural production for immediate use and more reliant on trade and commodity production. And as this happens, the bourgeoisie, who are non agricultural classes within capitalism, they produce commodities and trade them, they become more powerful, and the feudal landowners and clergy become less powerful. Um, and as this change in the balance of class forces happens, bourgeoisie start to develop these new ideas about how society should be structured. Ideas like individual rights, free trade, constitutional society. Um, these sound familiar. The American founding were <coughs> one of the first political groups to found a state based on these principles. So you're living in a society like the one that these people live in. Um, and Marx also talks a lot, lot about how the bourgeoisie developed in feudalism. So if you did not read the Communist Manifesto yet, go back and do it. Um, it's good stuff. Uh, so anyways, the French Revolution is sort of a break with feudalism. Uh, in French society, despite these changes to the underlying economic conditions, the feudal classes continue to monopolize political power. Uh, 
and then this political system reaches an impasse when the French monarchy goes broke. Um, it can't raise taxes on the poor, which is its usual method of making them, because the poor are already broke and starving. And it can't raise taxes on the aristocrats and the clergy, because while well, they are rich, and they're not really doing anything with that money, they're also protected by law and the feudal is increasing tax. Uh, so there's a financial crisis. To help resolve this, the king convenes the estates general, which is this quasi-parliamentary body that exists within the feudal. This body votes by class. There is one vote each for the aristocrats, the clergy, and everybody else. Um, everybody else is called third estate, and this portion of the assembly is led by the bourgeoisie, although they represent all classes except for the clergy and the aristocracy. Um, and so, in this arrangement, the clergy and the aristocracy are able to vote down any efforts at reform two to one, despite representing like maybe one percent of the French population. Um, and so therefore, this assembly is no more able to resolve the crisis than the king without this assembly. Um, so in response to this, the third estate, led by the bourgeoisie, breaks away and founds a new national assembly on the basis of those bourgeois ideas that I talked about earlier. This votes individually and is able to start passing. The monarchy and the aristocracy attempt to put this down by force, that fails. And from then on, basically get an escalating conflict between the National Assembly, representing the bourgeoisie, with the other classes in tow behind them, and the monarchy with the clergy and aristocracy on his side. And this ends with the total overthrow of the monarchy. Uh, now, by escalation, I don't really mean violence. Um, mean more that the political differences between the bourgeoisie in the National Assembly and the feudal classes become more irreconcilable and the changes to French society that the revolution is bringing about become more um, And not only are there radical changes within French society, feudal privilege is abolished, now everyone is equal before the law, and feudal feuds are abolished. A lot of aristocrats and clergy flee the country and their property is redistributed. Um, but other feudal societies in Europe get drawn into wars with the new French society. And the French society, for a while, is winning these wars and spreading its new system across Europe, drawing all of Europe into this class contract. Um, so this process, where you have a stable social system that meets people's needs, changes to the underlying economic conditions occur that destabilize that social system by setting a balance of class forces, and then a political break with the old society, founding a new society based on new values, new relations of productions, is historical materialism in action. Um, Marx generalized from this example and saw the same forces driving historical change in other situations, including his own time. And we can apply that method to other social systems, including the social system we live in right now. Um, so in the post-revolutionary European order, the French Revolution is eventually defeated, and Europe goes back to being ruled by monarchies. But this is only after the feudal classes have made huge concessions to the liberals and like the bourgeoisie are very much in the driver's seat of society. Society is also still very unstable. The break with the feudal system kind of opened the playing field. People are coming up with all kinds of ideas about how society should run, um, questioning everything about society. Uh, this basically breaks down into three political you're broadly aligned with the goals of the French Revolution, you're a liberal. Um, if you think that the French Revolution was a bad idea, Europe never should have left feudal traditions behind and you should go back as soon as possible and never think about doing anything else ever again, you're a reactionary. Um, and if you think that changes that go beyond the scope of the French Revolution are required, 
then you are a radical. And that is where Marx and other socialists fit in. Um, Marx, there were other socialists prior to Marx. Um, these were mostly rich utopians who would make moral appeals based on the plight of the poor, which was bad. Um, but obviously these projects failed because they weren't in the self-interest of the rich. Um, all these socialists, despite their other differences, share a commitment to holding some forms of property in common. Um, there are also other political tendencies within the radical category. Anarchism is one of them. Uh, so what makes Marx and the Communist Manifesto so important out of all of these guys? Why are we talking about him and not him? Uh, and that, I think, is because Marx based his socialism not on utopian moral appeals, but on his theory of historical materialism. So not only did he give us a vision of a better society, but he gave us a plausible means of achieving it backed by historical evidence. Um, Marx recognized that bourgeois society was still a class society, now divided instead of by feudal privileges, by property ownership into the bourgeoisie who owned property and extracted profits, and the working class who did not own property and sold their labor power in exchange for wages. And Marx predicted that within bourgeois society, like within feudal society, the working class would undergo a process of organizing, gaining economic power, and then overthrowing capitalist society to secure their existence. Um, and he already saw the first sprouts of this happening as of the Communist Manifesto's writing, this was around the same time that the very first trade unions were being organized in Europe. Um, and I think that this is a key point of difference between socialism, at least its Marxist varieties, and liberalism. Liberals tend to think that we're individuals striving to better society through reasoned argument. Socialists believe in this historical process and feel that we need to uh, insert ourselves into it and help the working class organize itself so that they are capable of affecting historical change. Um, in Marx's view, uh, nothing besides this would be sufficient. Uh, Marx also believed that because the working class, uniquely in history, has no property claims to protect, nothing to lose but their chains, they would be incentivized to create a truly classless society which would not have any contradictory material interests to balance and would transcend the historical cycle of class conflict. Um, now how do we get there? That is the question that still faces the working class and their ideological allies, which is all of us today. Um, that being said, Marx did have plenty of ideas about what the future working class state would look like. Um, and to talk some about that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, the Communist Manifesto, with that great historical context, gives us a couple of things. It gives us a political blueprint, uh, and it gives us theory to understand the world we live in. Uh, so, the manifesto, the reception when it was published, um, kind of a dud, it sold a thousand copies, uh, and the plan was for it to be translated into languages all over Europe, but it was not because it had such a weak reception. We're going to be talking next session about the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, uh, so attend next session, uh, we'll be talking about how uh, the Communist Manifesto was really took on this canonical significance around that time. Uh, so Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto for the Communist League. What was their political program? So essentially their political program was to <clears throat> unite workers um, and overthrow the bourgeoisie. Um, and their ideas are rooted in transforming the relationship between the worker and their labor. Um, so how do we go about this? 
So the first step is, um, I think if I was here, um, oh, that was a good slide to stay on. Um, <laughs> so the first step is um, the political power. Um, so the working class gains political power and uses its political supremacy to take over um, political capital from the bourgeoisie and instruments of production become a part of the state as the proletariat becomes the, work, the ruling class. Um, and so what is in the program? We can go to the next one. These are some of the planks of the communist political book. <laughs> internationalism. So Marx thought that inequality between classes was a historical contradiction that needed to be resolved. Same with inequality between nations. Um, so in his ideal worker state, all nations would participate in one system of government as equals. Uh, and this is in contrast to systems of, say, racial apartheid or imperialism, where nations participate in one system but not as equals. The next one is the abolition of private property. Now, I kind of think that Marx was being edgy here, but he does make a distinction between personal property, which is stuff that you use, um, like food you eat or bed you sleep in, and bourgeois private property, which is private ownerships in the means of production, like a factory or an apartment building that you rent to other people. Um, Marx saw that in capitalist society, the bourgeoisie used their ownership of these means of production to force the working class to agree to unfair terms in order to use them and produce for themselves. Um, that is what Marx wanted to abolish. Not, he's not going to take the toothbrush. Um, and then finally, a progressive income tax. This is probably one that we take for granted today. Um, since it is a reform that has happened in most capitalist societies, uh, but at Marx's time, it wasn't so much of a universal thing. And there is a strain of thought within liberalism that thinks that if you're rich, you own that property, why should you have to pay more taxes than anybody else? It's not fair. But Marx was famously a guy who was more about from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Um, so he was in favor of <coughs> taxes that would equalize wealth in society. Um, I'm going to hand back to Alice. So some other elements of the political program, which um, I'm going to also use to talk about the basis of his theory, um, start with the family. Um, so a lot of the ideas on the family in the Communist Manifesto come from Engels' um, property, family, um, and the state, but um, these ideas come from angles um, that the Victorian nuclear family is uh, an arm of bourgeoisie society, uh, and that the organization of the family is meant to encourage patrilineal inheritance, um, which maintains bourgeoisie cultural norms and social inequality. So when the ruling class becomes the when the working class becomes the ruling class, the traditional family is dissolved, uh, and a lot of the social relationships that we take for granted, um, it becomes clear that they are. We have been conditioned to accept them um, as part of capitalism. Um, we've noted it as controversial here because it has been taken up by many critics, um, which I will go into a little bit. Um, support for the oppressed, um, when the working class becomes the ruling class, all are free. Um, and so this means really expanding um, how we understand oppression and liberation. Um, and that when the working class um, is making the rules um, and holds political power, um, all forms of oppression will be gone. Also, something we will discuss in a moment. Um, and of course, free education and destruction of bourgeoisie social norms. So, following Marx, um, his 
work really gained popularity following his death, um, as most thinkers happens. Um, so in the 1930s, um, Marxist thought is really taken up by leftists in America and in Europe. Um, notably, one group uh, called the Frankfurt School, kind of a misnomer because they left Frankfurt, um, a group of German Jewish exiles who came to Colombia um, in Manhattan um, and produced theories of cultural Marxism. They can be considered neo Marxist or informed by Marx, but they're often just in conversation with Marx, um, critiquing him, filling in his gaps, um, and expanding the analysis and critique of bourgeoisie domination to include culture, um, mass media, things like that. Uh, Marxist feminism is another big school of thought that follows Marx, um, and this is looking at the role of women in the economy. Um, women are pretty notably absent from the Communist Manifesto, um, and the ways that their labor is also part of perpetuating um, capitalist supremacy, reproductive labor, forced birthing, um, criminalization of sex work, emotional labor, unpaid care work, uh, the relationship between private property, ownership, um, and patriarchy are all ways that the um, women's role in the economy and in the home reproduce uh, systems of bourgeoisie oppression. Um, and then racial capitalism. Uh, so Marx also does not contend with race uh, in the Communist Manifesto and the ways in which um, systems of enslavement also um, built the modern capitalist system and uh, system of um, exchange of goods. Uh, and so a lot of other thinkers that we will also discuss at other points in um, night school uh, take up racial capitalism. Um, so across all of these theories, these people following Marx, what, what tools do, does Marx give them and what does the Communist Manifesto give all of us? Uh, so primarily it's looking at the world through the lens of property and labor. Uh, it's looking for the revolutionary subject who has the most potential to liberate everyone. Uh, it's looking at the world through historical materialism, viewing history uh, as a dialectical relationship between humans and their labor and how that evolving relationship to meet our needs uh, is the driving force of history. Um, and of course, making history clear to itself and raising class consciousness are um, key aims of Marxist schools of thought. Um, how does this relate to us and DSA? Uh, so you'll see a lot of the pillars of the communist platform um, that we discussed that are right before the final section of the manifesto um, are very related to the political aims uh, here at DSA, um, including abolition of the carceral state, abolition of white supremacy, robust, powerful labor movement, economic justice, gender sexuality justice, Green New Deal, health justice, and housing for all. So these ideas informed by a perception of the world that things are not as they seem, uh, and that tools of oppression are rooted in labor and capitalism, and that to really make life better and to restore humanity to itself, we need to fundamentally transform um, our relations to one another through the economy. So that is the Communist Manifesto. Thank you. So did you all solve any problems in here? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, what about the, the cheerleading for capitalists? What do people make of that? Well, I think what it is. Yeah. yeah, we talked about how um, capitalism has kind of like reached everywhere in the world, and so there's this really broad base on which the socialist movement can uh, move from. Oh, there are 
Anybody have a Zoom? Uh, anyone else want to? Uh, sorry, I'm just setting up the timer so I know what's going on. I'll say something. Uh, yeah. It also allows for the creation of the productive forces themselves. The, like capitalism resulted in new technologies uh, that maybe a, a future socialist society could utilize. Um, so. As I see it, Marx was a post-capitalist. He believed that it was a necessary stage in human development where these technologies were created. Um, so, yeah, that we could use these technologies to figure out a, a, a better association in the future. Anyone else want to say anything? Jim? Um, well, in addition to, every, to what's been said, um, it brought a lot of workers together in single places, um, factories usually. Um, and it's much easier for workers to develop class consciousness and to organize workers if they're all in one factory than if they're spread out uh, all over the countryside. You oh, know. Slack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, that too. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it rescued them from the idiocy of rural life, as he says. Um, it's, and by reducing the worker to an economic unit, it, that also fosters class consciousness in a way. Because if all you have to do, if all you can do is remind and sell your labor power, you're more likely to develop consciousness as a worker. So I, I'm wondering, 174 years later, is it, um, has it worked out that way? <laughs> <laughs> one, one other point that is, I think, important here is that the, I think, Marx saw the development of the productive forces of labor productivity as creating the possibility to vastly reduce uh, the working day and to you know, reduce necessary labor and release a lot of, you know, working capital. I mean, capitalism is trying to produce a surplus value, trying to return that to individuals and, you know, community to collect. I think that was a very important aspect of how we saw capitalism being the basis for its eventual. Anyone else? Um, I have like, I kind of like that he acknowledges the achievements of capitalism. I think one is a very approachable way to open this conversation for a capitalist audience. And I think it, he takes this sort of like scientific process, like capitalism is a transitionary period but between feudalism or what once was, um, and it's just like a necessary transition. And instead of just purely demonizing it as something that shouldn't exist, I think he makes it a kind of practical, well, this is the step, and then the next step is inevitably communist or socialism to communism. Um, I think that for me is a little more compelling than um, a purely moral argument of this, this thing that let's do other thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, the inevitable part is a little. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> One wants to believe. Yeah. Uh, okay, so looking at the clock, I guess we should move on to number two. Um, question two. Why is the bourgeoisie unfit to rule? Any thoughts on this? Aside from there being selfish and corrupt and <laughs> depraved and all those things. <laughs> incentive is not a rational way to run a society. Uh, we have all these like gigantic public needs and we leave it up to the free hand of the market to kind of decide what's important to us and that just seems uh, kind of a crazy way to live to me. Uh, yeah, that's my two cents. Are you raising your hand or just scratching your head? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they, they kind of don't act in everybody 
Mike's own interest, you know, and that's, that's a little bit more self-explanatory. We have a lot of problems where, you know, people uh, would rather make more money than do what is uh, sustainable. And so that's why, you know, they kind of fit to rule. Like more, I think more people having control over a decision that directly affects them would make more sense than just a small group of people. There's no accountability to those people. Uh, um, yeah, I, I love that point. I was going to go in that direction and say, like, I think his argument is that the majority, their, the whole purpose of why they exist and to continue existing is to create and expand capital. So if their entire purpose as a class is to focus on the profit motive, that is their existence. Um, they're, need, they need to constantly expand, constantly create capital. It's almost impossible for them to rule um, over an entire other group of class when their their uh, interests are at odds with one another, um, so so it's not really possible for them to rule in favor of the working class as a whole. Not even just as a few people, but in general, it's not in their interest to rule in our interest. It's like I'm not all of them. <laughs> what about the second part of this? The uh, notion that capitalism lays uh, plants the seeds of its own destruction. Kind of like um, you cannot infinitely grow on the planet with finite resources, and so like that in and of itself is just a uh, long-term slow death in a sense. Yeah, I don't think Marx did mention that in passing in Capital, but you know it's not really a, a, a certainly a very contemporary notion. Yeah, but that's just that's just me. I'm not I'm just saying it's why. Yeah, but certainly you know, really at the forefront right now. Uh, emphasizes is the extremely intense alienation of the working class. The labor class is essentially um, dis like becoming destroyed by the, by the ruling class. So the system can't go on if, if the labor class is reduced to, you know, mentally to that of a peanut and unable to function with lack of resources, lack of uh, basic need support. Yeah, there's an alternative possibility instead of the inevitable uh, overthrow of the capitalist class, the, class, the two classes uh, engage in mutual destruction, which is kind of a, a bit of a throwaway line, but uh, sometimes that seems a little compelling. Um, yeah, do, do you buy this? Do, do after you know 170 years, do we still think that? Uh, the work of less is going to be you know, the great diggers of capitalism. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to, but in our group, we made the point that uh, the capital, the last time the bourgeoisie has really had their back against the wall was the 1930s. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's been almost 90 years. And they've, in my estimate, they've been able to provide a decent living to an acceptable percentage of the population in the West, at least. And, you know, we can talk about that that's not going to continue, but you know, I don't know that time horizon right now. And so, I very much do want to believe in the thesis. I just don't know when we can, when the working class, especially in advanced capitalist countries, are going to not be so conservative and right wing. Um, so I don't know politically, I guess maybe we discuss that next week, Bolsheviks. I don't really know how politically that works, and that's what I'm deeply confused by. Well, you're asking, you know, you're asking people to uh, give up a certain amount of stability for an extremely uncertain future. Uh, unless things are really falling apart. That's, yes, it's, and it's, 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 you know, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also think, you know, it's worth maybe pulling out a little bit, like Marx's, so there's a thesis about, like, the destruction of capitalism, and there's a thesis about the advance of working class politics, and I think, you know, what's definitely has been true over the 20th century is that, like, the transformation of the world has, like, Learned, and all a lot of the good transformations of the world, insofar as they happened over the 20th century, like universal health care in a lot of places, um, or you know whatever we can name a list, um, democracy. Those things were like done through working class politics. So I do think like you know the question 
Marx's prediction that like working class politics would be like the direction of history and would play like a huge determining role seems to me like very, very true. Um, the question of like the destruction of capitalism seems like that, that working class politics was heading towards the full end of capitalism. That seems like maybe less borne out by historical change. Yeah, as for democracy, I saw an ad for the Daily Show that the Daily Show said covering democracy is still, as if it still existed. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think uh, we should move on to question three, looking at the clock. What's the difference between yeah, bourgeois private property as opposed to personal property? I heard a bunch of people talking about whether their toothbrush would be seized or, <laughs> or socialized. Um, well, we think that wouldn't happen. But yeah, what is this distinction? Yeah. Bourgeois private property is that property that if you own it and it comes at the expense of the reproduction of the rest of society, then you should not have it. But so if you have a toothbrush, that's fine. Everyone should have a toothbrush. But you can't have all the toothbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> but also, if you're too much, you make money <laughs> no. by exploiting, I don't know, the toothless or something. Right. That would, uh, that, that, that also is for sure. In the same way, like, you know, if you can live somewhere, you can have a home, but you can't have homes at the expense of other people don't have homes. Or charging other people to live in it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder if you could say maybe bourgeois private property is property for use of profit. Personal property would be for its use value, maybe. Yeah. Um, but it really is implicit. I guess if you have a car and you do some Uber driving, what's that? Your car. But you're a partisan, you're not really a capitalist. Yeah, and then you're also a thrall to Uber. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, I think that Marx saw uh, production as a social process. So capitalism only works if we have both capital and labor. Um, and the bourgeoisie are kind of using their right to ownership of the means of production to get labor to agree to a deeply unfair rate. Um, and I think Marx thinks it's justified to ban that but not necessarily any reason or like it's not desirable to ban only personal property, which is something we've done throughout all of this. Um, but the propagandists in capital want you to believe that they yeah, they're after your personal property. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Why will the, this class struggle have a different result from all previous class struggles? And uh, yeah, I'll let Lessing have them first. Any thoughts on that? Should we get Peggy to do this for this one? <laughs> Go ahead. So I think this is tied to what it says in the manifesto about we're simplifying class antagonisms, where in other societies, like feudalism, for instance, there were different levels of classes, different kinds of classes. And if there is only these two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the vast majority of humanity is in the proletariat, the overwhelming majority. So if it's somehow, and people talk about it in terms of like the 99%, the 1%, it doesn't quite break down like that, but let's Think of it that way. If the 99% overthrow the 1%, then that's, what else is there? That next 9% would be a problem. Right. <laughs> Character? I thought that um, he said 
order for there to be classes, there must be exploitation. And once the proletariat is in, is in charge, um, exploitation will cease, and therefore classes will no longer exist. But after a little bit of time, <laughs> you work out of it. Whether they're, you know, there's a transition period. The fire squads and stuff, they say it always is. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I think another important point is that the proletariat is a property, property less class. So they're very different than all other class, like, you know, the bourgeoisie was a property class that emerged out of, you know, struggling to institute property rights for different forms of exploitation. And Marx and Engels believed that the proletariat had no capacity to do that other than to abolish class society. That, that's, that's how I've always interpreted it. Uh, so we have a question on Zoom. Oh, okay. Oh, is it? Do I see it down here? No, I just see a question down here. I just see question four on this screen. Oh, is it for me to chat? Excuse me, why is it? Yeah, I think, can you get the question? Uh, no, you have to come closer. <laughs> I'll just say it here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, this is a good question. I guess I, I'm thinking of the last question. Um, I think uh, the, like, well, I don't know if I'm like, I don't know, like, over, like, I, I like to think, like, we're kind of like, uh, uh, like, the goal is to kind of, like, merge with the proletariat. Uh, but I think like the really important thing that Marx is doing with the manifesto is like, I mean, it, literally he's writing a program. Like this is a political program. And I think like the basis of it is like talking about a strategy and like trying to get people um, like this, the Communist League and, and later on, right, the, the German, uh, the early German Marxist parties, the, you know, all, all the great second international uh, parties had these uh, programs where they, you know, got communists together and uh, developed a political strategy. And that's, I think, the inherent form of that is really important uh, in thinking about, like, I mean, the program that he's writing, the, the Communist Manifesto is the story of, like, past, present, future, which is, understands that like, conditions, directions, and results. It's just in the text itself. And so that act of, like, coming together and thinking about, okay, like, where are we at? Where are we going? And, like, developing a strategy uh, based on this, like, uh, understanding of, of capitalism and understanding of the social system, I think that itself is like a really important foundational act to like, like doing politics. Um, so I think that's like the advantage itself is like, you know, that, that you can, like is the, man the manifesto, is the program, is the just uh, thinking about together, where are we coming, where are we going, and then talking about it with your, you know, at, Back in Marx's day, I guess in the public square, yeah. uh, but maybe now with, well, with Marx, your Marx like the pub too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, we have a theory. We have a plan. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, that, no, I love how Steve. Yeah, I, I don't. I might have been brought up already, but I think Marx also was saying that you know the proletariat would abolish itself. Like it would be with the abolition of class society as a whole. That's why it's different from all the history trouble. Yeah, to kind of touch on like what I did brought up, yeah, I don't really necessarily think that it's over the proletariat. I mean like the idea is supposed to be that people who are organizing are in and from the proletariat. I mean like I mean I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, but I'm also a worker. I'm just like in the proletariat. I don't know if I'm over the proletariat. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to take that. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left. We're going to do some announcements. Is that one last question? Yeah, there's that one last question. So I think well, I was just going to ask people for general impressions of this as a document. Uh, okay. It's just, uh, I think it's a literary masterpiece, and uh, I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts on just the work as a whole. Any, as, you know, as a manifesto, but also as you know, um, 
the call to action and inspiration and analysis. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just because I really don't have deep into it. I do have a question like as far as how do you uh, reconcile the links of how would I say like violence that uh, you met with as far as like military as far as like the you met with I'm trying to take these actions like in, in, in the case of Marx like I, I guess predicting the, cap the capability that these big capitalists have of committing violence in, in many different ways, like completely spiking people up. As, as far as like, you know, trying to take these actions. Yeah, Engels had a great phrase, the uh, insane cruelties of revenge that uh, the bourgeoisie is capable of and felt, felt his power ground. Right. Certainly good with the insane cruelties of revenge. <laughs> I think for Marx, it's like the, it's, it's, it's violence or it's a death. Like, like we, the workers will be worked to death. Like the, um, this essay you wrote right before the Communist Manifesto on the coming revolution, um, combat or death, bloody struggle or extinction <coughs> is the last line. Um, so it's, it's either bloody struggle or it's the loss of poetry. Any, anyone else? I'll say. Oh, okay. um, just that it's um, kind of our cultural heritage, right? As socialists, I think it's really important for us to know. And there's so much, um, there's so many different perspectives on socialism, and it's nice that this is a sort of a grounding, family document for us all. It's, you know, it's accessible and lays out the point, and it makes excellent arguments in short, you know, amount of pages. Um, uh, and he does it in a, an extremely fun, like original, witty, literary way that's accessible. Um, yeah. So that's why we read it every year. Right? Yeah. It's common ground for us. I always get something new out of it. Every time I read it, it's like I, I can't believe I never saw that part of it. Yeah, it's like reading Shakespeare and just so many familiar phrases that have just entered the language and I didn't think about it. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy? I was going to say, just on that point, you know, Alice mentioned earlier that it kind of uh, fell with the dud when it was first published, but I think since it's the second best selling book next to the Bible and most printed book in human history. Um, so, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Never got any royalties on it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see? I think um, just for, for our own use, because we had it in the 21st century, um, quite separated from, I guess, I, at least I feel, quite separated from the social tradition of the 20th century, it's just refreshing to see um, all the discussion of alienation so upfront, talking about the stripping away of all the you know, halos of all the priests and poets are coming up. And we, this is something we can some of that is good. <laughs> it's, that's, well, yeah, sure. For sure. But <laughs> I think it's. Yeah, but, uh, but I think, you know, we get to this point where recently we've been talking about um, how the right really is sort of gobbling up this critique of, you know, modernity or alienation for their very nefarious ends, whereas we are not really, as leftists, providing that critique. And Marx obviously is quite a bit there that's still so relevant to us. And I, I found that very um, helpful to understanding modernity. Um, our sense of being cut off <laughs> from each other, from history, from, from me. Yeah, that's ours. They stole it. Yeah. <laughs> Jacob? Um, well, I definitely think it's better than the Bible. Um, <laughs> I think. Uh, There's some good stuff in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, what was said about how seeing, you see something new every time read it again. I mean, it's a, it, there's a lot of like complex argument in it that's made very lucid and, and clear. Um, but I also really like it because it's of its, um, you know, it's just so rousing. Um, it, it's a very, it's a very potent kind of reminder not to be, not to give into despair. And, you know, these are pretty bleak times, I think we can all agree. 
Um, so I think that's that's helpful. And um, you know, if, I I don't actually think that revolution is inevitable. But um, but reading the the manifesto reminds me that it's not impossible either. 